Can't they just secede? Can't we get just get rid of them? The way people talk about the South, you wouldn't necessarily understand how incredibly powerful it has been in U.S. history. And we live with this mythology so that we don't have to deal with all of what the nation is. I want us to move through history with some humane values, right? With some decency. Tell us something that is useful for being honest with respect to the values we proclaim. Still coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Searching for a place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people doing it? Look to the U.S. South, says today's guest, historian and author Imani Perry. Look to the South, to the suffering, theft and greed wrapped up in colonization, plantation slavery, and the model of addictive global capitalism that's brought us everything from cotton to Coca-Cola. Look to the guilt, repression, and denial that U.S. culture pretends is just a Southern thing. But look, too, to the real, complex, intimate, rebellious, mixed up, intensely creative South that has led most of the revolutions in this divided nation and brought along a whole lot of the best food, drink, dance, and music. In her latest book, South to America, a journey below the Mason-Dixon to understand the soul of a nation, Perry takes us on a trip through the region to delve into the realities that exist beneath the stereotypes. Perry's the Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton and the author of, among other books, Looking for Lorraine, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry, the author of A Raisin in the Sun. South to America is just out from Echo Books, and I'm very glad to welcome Imani Perry to this show. You are from the South. Talk a little bit about your own personal origins and why you went back there right now for this book. Yeah, thank you. So um, actually, your introduction was just so beautiful and apt because the story of the South is more complex and more politically rich in, uh, than, than what it's given credit for. I was born into, on the one hand, a kind of, you know, traditional striving working class Black family, but also had parents who were radicals and involved in the late era of the freedom movement, um, prison organizing, um, organizing um, uh, workers in steel mills and, and coal mines and the like. And so there is both a way in which I was organically rooted in what the South was historically and its people, and also in a submerged political tradition that made explicit connections to the globe. Uh, so, you know, so 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 it was it was quite, um, I guess, sort of natural to to turn to the South in this moment. Um, you know, people keep talking about how we're in the midst of culture wars of various sorts, um, as though there's something new. Um, and in point of fact. These are essential fundamental tensions that have existed since the beginning, since Europe, the European encounter with the South, driven by desire, um, imagination, and greed, and a willingness to exploit and push people out and, and, and suck the lives out of people um, who were brought in. And, and so we're in this a kind of cyclical relationship between land and the people and, and power. And I wanted to tell a story that I thought would illuminate how that is. I've, I'm from the South, but from the South of England, or at least my, my, the British side of my family come from the London area. The American side of my family, my grandmother, my mother actually came from Iowa. Um, but I've, I've heard you interviewed by white hosts as this book has come out who have been quick to say they are from the South. And, and I just wondered whether you cringe a little at that because there are so many Souths. At the same time, there is this intimacy that you describe, a, a word that comes up a lot. In yes. Your yeah. I mean, part of it is, you know, there's this incredible intimacy, particularly across the color line that is distinct in U.S. history. Um, and also a very delicate detente tension that exists. Um, and that, that sort of dynamic is, I think, um, 
so frequently misunderstood because people overread what legal segregation was, right? It's about stratification, not actually about keeping people apart. Um, as a deep, you know, so intimate connections um, in the domestic sphere, for example, even if public facilities were not, I don't cringe. Um, I do, I mean, I think what's interesting is to have the conversation and, and actually sit in what is uh, when, or moments of discomfort, which is part of what I try to do in the book. I have all of these encounters. Um, you have an encounter with a, with a white woman who, uh, whose husband left her, she was a Lyft driver and she became a faith healer and she was sneaking into hospitals. I mean, you know, an encounter with a, with a man who was refilling the, um, the candy machine at the airport. And so these interactions with white Southerners and trying to make sense of them, often we're speaking the same language, but I'm also trying to think about what does it mean? There's some things we can talk about and some things we can't and things that are very easy to do, like hold someone's hand and pray but there's territory that is delicate, right? And that, you know, that's part of the work of what the book is trying to get to. You know? The territory is delicate and also has been invaluable to this country. You write, um, Phil Coffer's Steal Lives. You write that American exceptionalism, that sense that we are somehow special and ordained as such is a myth sedimented on Southern prosperity, oil, coal and cotton. And even if you choose to wrap all of that sort of history in a kind of romantic nostalgia, you say integrity requires that the stories be halfway honest. Yes. Talk about that. Absolutely. Because, you know, so when I, for example, when I think about the history of mining, this incredible history of protest, of organizing, right, of union organizing, that coexisted, right, with a white supremacist social order such that groups of people who are both being subject to exploitation, who are both having literally like, you know, their lives sucked out, air sucked out of their lungs, um, are, are encouraged to dissociate from each other, right, in the service of this myth, right? It, it's, you know, so when I, so I, some of these encounters are me trying, one of the things that I say is I, I feel much, um, I have more care and sensitivity to the quote unquote hillbillies than the one who wrote their elegy, right? To think about what it means, what the deep sort of structure um, of hierarchy in a society means. And we could say it, see it more recently with the way Joe Manchin sort of disregards caring for his constituency, right? I mean, so these are the kinds of, um, um, sort of encounters that I want to sort of disentangle in, in order to have us think in, in a more honest way about the regimes of power that exist there and also um, who's served by, who's served, who's disserved um, by them. I mean, I don't want to keep coming back to me, but in the UK, we have a kind of north-south divide too, and, and a similar relationship to the north as exists here in the south, in the sense that this sense of the very part of the country that has been the driver of economic um, conquest, success, if you want to call it that, wealth for sure, um, is the part we choose to disdain and distance ourselves from. Absolutely. Overlaid with race in this country in a unique and deadly way, um, how do we get out of that? And how can you help us think about that beyond just this kind of guilt and, um, you know, rushing it under the carpet? Well, for, for me, I mean, I don't, I'll, I'll admit, I, I, if I knew how we could get out of it, I would, <laughs> I would be doing a different kind of work probably. But I do think that there's a necessary move, which is to uh, be honest about, you know, kind of reject the narrative, right? So the standard narrative is, you know, the ever more perfect union, the, the mythos of the nation. And then the South is this sort of embarrassing, backwards, um, different, strange kind of place. It is the repository for all of the nation's sins. You see it every time something bad happens politically, right? Can't we just, can't they just secede? Can't we get, just get rid of them? Mm. When of course, the ways of the South are precisely what allowed this nation to become a global power. It's prosperity, right? So it's not as though that is the shame of the South, that is the shame of the nation, right? And 
So to be, you know, so to the extent that I'm, you know, so a, a, a precondition for actually addressing these ways is, is to be honest about who benefits from them. They're not, you know, <laughs> the way people talk about the South, you wouldn't necessarily understand how incredibly powerful it has been in US history, right? But, you know, the Revolutionary War debt paid by the South, DC is where it is because of Southern power, global wealth, because of mass, num you know, all of this unfree labor and, and the power of cotton, you can go on and on and on. Um, so it's power, it's a powerful region, right? And it's an influential region. And we live with this mythology so that we don't have to deal with all of what the nation is, right? And why those ways can be powerful because it benefits the nation. So, so to me, the pre, you know, the, the necessary but insufficient step is to be is to, to talk about that, right? Um, and then of course, you know, we, you know, how many generations of people have said some version of this, but to understand you know, the structure of haves and have nots in a more sophisticated way and not to be, you know, moved about by um, the political whims of elites so easily is, of course, you know. You, you write, and of course it's true that a lot of people talk about backwardness in relation to the South, but when you talk to Southern organizers, they'll say, you know, with the, as goes the South, so goes the nation. The, the South is often the cutting edge of things, whether it's plantation econ economics or extraction or civil rights. Yes. I mean, oil, car culture, right? Um, certainly it's at the front lines now with an impending environmental disaster, right? You know, being at the cutting edge of so much of the disasters, also why it is often at the cutting edge of social movement and organizing, right? Whether it's environmental justice issues now or um, whether it's prison issues. So one of the things that I talk about in the book is that my parents were involved in prison organizing in the 70s. It seems like an early timeline, but of course the South, what was happening was a harbinger of what was going to happen all over the country. So it wasn't, it was there first, right? decades before people started describing mass incarceration, it was very apparent that it was coming if you were in the South, right? And the prison being on the very plantations where people were once enslaved is, is an indication, right, of, 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 the, of, the, of its heart, right? In Mississippi, you mentioned that your parents, I think, knew or at least um, knew of Chokwe Lumumba, who went on for a bit oh, yes. to, be, to be mayor of Jackson. His son now carrying forward his vision to some extent a vision of a new kind of approach to economics, sort of the opposite of the plantation economy. Can you talk about that and what, what else you may have seen on your travels that gave you a sense of, oh, this could be the future coming out of the South? Right. Well, I mean, I do. There is this group and they range from sort of liberal to leftist, right? But of young Black mayors who are trying to reimagine the economy of the South, I take one of the models for doing so to be Richard Arrington, who was the first black mayor in Birmingham, Alabama, who was part of the mobilization for his election was a police killing of a black teenager, right? In, in the seventies when I was a little girl. And so there, a, a, a teenage girl um, was killed. And so again, right? So we're thinking about these issues with Black Lives Matter, but that was an impetus for a really important political organizing of, 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 um, of black communities in Birmingham, you know, in the seventies. And so, so it has a tradition. I think these new models, they're trying to imagine what does it mean to actually establish um, safety nets at the local level? What does it mean to actually resist at the local level? You know, we, people talk about the South in terms of red states, which in, in and of itself is a kind of strange formulation because it it depends on the electoral college formula, right? When the whole country is actually purple, right? <laughs> but the red state, blue state thing. So you actually don't get to see that kind of local work that's happening easily unless you're in the South. Um, and there's a tradition there, you know? And, and you know, I, I describe Chokwe Lumumba, I describe him as a, um, as a scion of sorts, right? Um, you know, and it's, I tell a story about being um, in Cuba with a woman who, a radical who was in exile, who had been part of the New African People's Organization, and how we talked about his election as a victory. Um, and that's also important, right, that there's a tradition of radical politics that sees electoral politics as important, 
not to the exclusion of other kinds of organizing, but integral to a larger project of imagining liberation. And so and sees that black belt with its huge density of black voters and black people as a, a rich a fertile soil for the kind of change that you're talking about. Yes, and I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, notwithstanding Mississippi's poverty and its, you know, deeply problematic um, uh, uh, executive, um, that it has the most extensive black political network anywhere in the country. And that comes directly out of the history of SNCC. Um, and so there are still efforts to mobilize and there's still a great deal of possibility there. And, and a, lot, a lot in terms of um, instructing other regions about how to think about politics on the hyper local level where it really does matter. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. We're talking with Imani Perry, author of South to America, A Journey Below the Mason-Dixon to Understand the Soul of a Nation. And throughout the book, you have this kind of Zen-like balance of, of the of the the problematic, the, the troubling, and the full of potential. Um, and, and, and you mentioned Birmingham, and it's impossible not to think of Dr. King, and particularly this time of year, um, and his letter from Birmingham jail that, that talked about urgency, um, and the urgency of now, and that change isn't inevitable. You know, we like to think of that arc tilting towards justice, but in that letter he says there is such a thing as being too late. And the other thing that your storytelling does that's so beautiful is to remind us how history doesn't just go in one direction. Progress doesn't just go in one direction. Um, and we've seen very flourishing, healthy black economies just destroyed by white reaction. How do you make sense of that? And, and is that anything to do with how you chose to tell the story, which was not in a kind of linear? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very, the, the nonlinearity and also even the multiple meanings at the level of the sentence are really important to the story. The book begins by talking about set dances in, um, in Louisiana in the 19th century and the variation between different types of European set dances and the quadrille, which is becomes a metaphor for, for various political parties vying for control over the lives of, um, of unfree people. So, Given that I think that there is an essential tension, right? There's the mythos of the nation, um, imagination, aspiration, growth. And then that is always in, this, in the history of this country, deeply connected to pushing people out, grinding them down, working them to death, right? Given that that has become a way that, of being that is so integral to the cult, the, the political culture, the economic culture of this nation, we necessarily wind up in a cyclical relationship to ideas of freedom um, or justice or inclusion because those ways slip back in over and over again. They are seen as norms. So, for example, you know, when people, when we talk about gentrification, that's an old way, right? That starts um, with the relationship to the indigenous, right? When we talk about what it means to not make a living wage, that's an old way, right? When we talk about child removal, it harkens all the way back to both slavery and the indigenous boarding schools. You know, when we talk, when we think of stories of the movement, and Birmingham is really important to me because it was an industrial city. And so organizing was, yes, about, you know, segregation, but it was also about labor. It was about work, right? And that, and so when we, so when I go now and talk about who's working in chicken fat plants now, right? Or catfish farms, where historically it was black people who were brought in because they, work, they were forced to work for a lower wage and now it's people from Central America, but the relation is still the same, right? There, these sort of ideas that people who don't count can just be brought in um, and worked and worked and worked and vulnerable, right? Politically vulnerable, vulnerable for, to policing and the like, these are these are habits, <laughs> you know. They're habits. They're assumptions about acceptable ways of dealing with human beings. Now, that makes me think of something else that you write. You write that black people in the South have a steeliness learnt of what they've been up against, 
and of the realization that they have no option but to fight, that there's no other place that's going to save us. And it reminds me of a conversation we had on this show not so long ago about the border and the, and the U.S. mythology of always having somewhere else to go, um, you know, go west, young man, all the rest of it, having a frontier you can go beyond. We're at our limits geographically and um, environmentally. What's the lessons, what are the lessons of the South or, or a few that you want to lift up about the steeliness of staying where you are? Part of my thought about that steeliness is, of course, because I don't come from a great migration family in the sense of, we, you know, people in my family moved to the urban South, but my family is not a family that moved to Chicago or Detroit or, or, or what have you, or Philadelphia. Um, and so the sort of sense of the staying and fighting part feels, um, you know, almost sort of organic to me as a sensibility. Um, but, you know, a certain register, it's like, irrespective of where you are physically, given the power of the United States globally, and part of what I write about in the book is the reach of the South into, you know, politics with the Middle East and politics with, the, with Central America and the rest the, and you know that that is actually really significant to understand whether you're actually physically there or elsewhere, right? If we care about the human condition, one has to sit in that space at a certain level, right? And sit in what it means to, for example, um, completely destroy the earth, right? In the service of industry, right? You, you, I one of the and I I um there's a couple of examples for me that were really potent is the way people talk about off the coast of North Carolina, the trees older than Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I love that because, you know, North Carolina is the Bible belt, right? And that they, people, there, there's almost a kind of tacit awareness. Something came before this ideology, mm -hmm. right? Or the cypress trees in the Gulf Coast, right? That are, that are, you know, thousands of years old. There's something that came before. And if, I think there's something meaningful about attending to the land that reminds you that something came before that is worthy of preserving before these ideas that are treated as literally gospel. Right? Idea, the, the land has those ideas uh, worthy of preserving. Also the, the, the blood and sweat soaked into it that is our legacy. Yes. Um, you say history, what do you say is instructive? History is an instruction? Yeah. What's it teach? Instruction. Um, it is. I mean, I think, you know, I think I, I think of it as an instruction in contrast to myth, the romance. Um, and I and you know, it's very easy to be particularly critical of the United States, but nationalisms period are often based in romances that evade. Um, the complexity of history and its ugliness, right? Unless it's fitting into a master narrative. And so to me, when I attend, you know, if I walk, I would walk through landscapes and just try to be attentive, you know, um, architecture, land, sites of, of various kinds of events. Um, and it, it's wild in many instances. I mean, I'm, I'm not disciplined in this, but it's a, it's a reminder history how we tell the story is always a choice it's like you know with map making right so Bonini's paradox says if you put everything on a map a map isn't useful something's very similar about that with history right so you can't tell every detail but the details you choose are reflective of values and priorities and so for me the question so I want us to move through history with some humane values right with some decency and be taught by that Right? If we pay attention, who counted, who didn't, who lived, who died, who worked, who, who had leisure, all those kinds of questions um, tell us something that is useful for being um, you know, honest with respect to the values we proclaim. <laughs> South to America, a journey below the Mason-Dixon to understand the soul of a nation. It's out now from Echo Books, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. Thanks so much for joining us. It's really been a pleasure to have you. I ended my conversation with Imani Perry by asking her the question I so often ask my guests about the experience that leads them to have confidence that the changes they seek are truly possible. She ended by saying, just look at the South, look at the history of this country. 
We may not have come as far as we want from chattel slavery, Jim Crow, and absolute denial of human rights, but we've come some distance. Looked through the lens of some imagined fantasy past, these may indeed be difficult times, but considered through the lens of accurate, complicated history. For anyone who believes in equality, human rights, justice, democracy, the American experience, we have made progress. Imani also had great things to say about Elvis, Aretha, sex in the South, and more. Luckily, we've captured all of that in our uncut conversation. We'll post it at our website. You can find it there. Till the next time, I'm Laura Flanders. Stay kind, stay curious, and thanks for joining me.